Guys, uh, we've been having a lot of technical difficulties, uh, so we had to make some adjustments uh, real time here. Um, but I want to thank you for having me uh, today at uh, the History of Diving Museum. And Emily and, uh, and also Lisa, um, it's, a, it's a great honor. And today I'm going to talk about um, Diving with a Purpose, uh, Maritime Archaeology Program, and then specifically um, the Tuskegee Airmen Project, which is something that's really, really dear to my heart. Um, so you can go to the next slide, um, please. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Eric Denson. I'm a lead instructor for the Diving with a Purpose uh, program, also a board member. I've been involved with uh, Diving with a Purpose since its inception, um, and, and we're going into actually our 17th year now. Um, I'm co-founder and president of Diverse Orlando Scuba Club, which is a, an affiliate club of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers, uh, also known as NAVS. I'm a Patty Dive Master. I've been certified since 1992. Um, I'm an AAUS, NOAA, um, and NAVS Foundation Scientific Diver. So we do a lot of our work with NOAA and also the National Park Service. I was inducted into the NAVS Hall of Fame in 2010. And um, I do all of this stuff. I wish I could do it for a living, but I do have a day job, which is a pretty cool day job. Um, I work for NASA. I am the electrical uh, chief engineer at the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. I've been with NASA. It'll be actually 31 years next month. I am a graduate of Howard University. I have a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Howard University and a Master of Science uh, in Electrical Engineering from Polytechnic University, which is poly, uh, has uh, turned into part of NYU now, New York University. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about diving with a purpose. Our motto is uh, restoring our oceans and preserving our heritage. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated, dedicated to the conservation and protection of submerged uh, heritage resources. We provide education, uh, training, certification, and field experience to adults and youth uh, in the fields of maritime archaeology and, and ocean conservation. But we do have a special focus of DWP is the protection, documentation, and interpretation of African slave trade slave trade um, shipwrecks, and also the maritime history and culture of African Americans. Um, our organization started as a volunteer archaeology program under a partnership with members of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and the National Park Service to document uh, shipwrecks in Biscayne National Park. But since then, we have expanded and grown leaps and bounds with our program. You can go to the next slide. So how did we start? Um, I think we have a very interesting history as far as a diving with a purpose. Back in 2003, uh, members of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers, including myself, participated in a documentary called the Guerrero Project, which was about the search for the slave ship uh, Guerrero um, that sunk off the coast of uh, the Key Largo area, um, as told by the book by Gail Swanson. The documentary also tells an interesting story or interesting, uh, if you will, uh, uh, battle between treasure hunters and archeologists and their opposing views and also the location of the ship. Um, some of you might have known uh, the Brenda Lesendorf, uh, but the late Brenda Lesendorf was the only uh, park archeologist, um, uh, only archeologist in Biscayne National Park at the time. She was a star in one of the documentary and um, in 2005, her and uh, Kenneth Stewart, who is the, uh, he's a, he is the uh, founder of uh, Diving with a Purpose and also the Tennessee Aquatic Project, they kind of brainstormed together uh, to start Diving with a Purpose. And the reason being, uh, again, that uh, Brenda was the only park arche uh, only archaeologist in the park, and she needed help to document all of these shipwrecks. And Ken uh, and, and a lot of us part, uh, volunteered to help her out and learn archaeology techniques. And so um, to help us assist when we did find the Guerrero and actually uh, we actually would know what we were doing <laughs> when we came to uh, documenting the, those shipwrecks and, and using archaeology techniques. You can go to the next slide. 
So uh, again, we started in 2005. And um, this is an annual program. We do a couple of uh, field schools uh, each year. Uh, over 500 people have participated in the program uh, and since 2005, resulting in uh, over 185 what we call maritime archaeology advocates, including over 78 youths have uh, participated in the program. We've documented over 18 shipwrecks, including 18th and 19th century sailing vessels, World War II aircraft, and we've accumulated over 18,000 volunteer hours in Biscayne National Park and the National Marine Sanctuaries. I'll talk about some of our expeditions, including the Guerrero, and then I'll really go into detail about the um, Tuskegee Airmen Project. Uh, we've received a lot of uh, awards uh, along the way. One of the big awards we received was the Take Pride in America Award, and that was uh, given to us by the Department of the Interior. And you see a picture there. We actually got a chance to visit uh, Washington, D.C., and actually get a, a tour of the White House at the time. Uh, we've been featured in a few documentaries. One is uh, Changing Seas, and some of you might be familiar with the Changing Seas uh, TV series, PBS. And we were featured in the episode of Sunken Stories about the uh, our search for the slave ship Guerrero. Um, we received uh, awards from uh, uh, Preserve America Steward designation by from First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, we have the exhibits actually in the New African and American History and Culture Museum. I'll talk show a little bit about that. Our program director, Mr. Stewart, was uh, uh, selected as Scuba Diving Magazine's uh, Sea Hero of the Year in 2018. And um, we, uh, some of our members assisted in the identification of the last slave ship, Clotilda. And I'll talk more about that. Of course, we celebrated our 15th year in the history of diving museum. And part of that uh, um, um, uh, uh, effort there too, we participated in the, some of our members in the enslaved documentary. Maybe some of you have saw that with Samuel L. Jackson. We got a chance to beat him. Go to the next slide, Emily. So um, our Diving with a Purpose Maritime Archaeology Program, um, we have a field school that we conduct every year. Um, we, we, we actually have one for adults and actually one for youth uh, um, program. And it's an intense one week uh, field school program. We teach the basics of maritime archaeology, ship construction, artifact identification, mapping techniques, and when you look at things from a historical perspective, and, and we even get involved in uh, uh, research with our uh, principal, principal investigators here. You know, slaves, um, not, not just slave ships, but ships in general, they tell a compelling story. It's not all about just mapping the ship and, and, and documenting it. These, these ships tell a story. And uh, the different artifacts can tell you the date of the ship and... Uh, you know, maybe the uh, area origin, uh, country of origin, and also too, again, like the size of the anchor, you see a picture there that could tell you, uh, again, the date of the ship, uh, the size of the ship. And then you have other things like uh, down at the bottom there, some of you may or may not recognize that they look like uh, uh, bracelets or even horseshoes there. But those are things uh, that tell another compelling story. And those down there are, are manilas. And some of you may or may not wanna, um, know what a manila is, but it was used uh, during the slave trade and actually brought and sold slaves uh, using this as a sort of currency. And I actually have one here uh, that I'm holding up that actually um, I actually purchased here in uh, the Tampa area. And this is it's made out of brass and I got this only for, I think it was about $11 in one of the, you know, Mer you know uh, uh, souvenir stores, if you will. And they really didn't know what it was and what it was used for. And so these things really tell a compelling story. And I got on my soapbox and told them, I said, this was actually used to buy and sell a human being. And so, you know, they, I think they had a different perspective of what they were uh, selling. And this was actually recovered from a, a, a shipwreck. Uh, I believe in, in uh, off the coast of Florida too as well. You can go to the next slide, Camille. So I'm gonna briefly before I, I get into the Tuskegee uh, project itself, I'm gonna talk about some of our the 
missions and, and, and programs that we're doing. Go to the next one. So one of the projects that I did mention, we've been involved with the search for the Guerrero, which was a Spanish pirate ship um, that was wrecked in December of 1827 uh, off the coast of Key Largo. And it was wrecked carrying a cargo, if you will, of 561 African enslaved uh, people who were being en route to Cuba for, um, for slaves uh, to, to, to be slaves. Um, fortunately, 41 of the captive Africans drowned. It's a very compelling story. And I mentioned the, the Guerrero documentary and also the book. Um, I, I really highly suggest, and I could do a whole nother presentation just on the Guerrero. Um, but we've been involved with, uh, we partnered with NOAA at the time and also the Mel Fisher Maritime Heritage Society to, first, to, to search for that slave ship Guerrero. We did two expeditions in 2010 and 2012. Uh, pieces of ceramic glass and uh, uh, ceramics and glass, iron shot, wood samples recovered from the site and were examined. We did site maps. Um, and that mission, too, was, was documented by, uh, um, was, was featured in the Changing Seas. We did, there were additional site surveys done by uh, Diving Under Purpose and the National Park Service in 2017. Um, there's a lot of empirical evidence that points to um, the site being the, the Guerrero, but there was no smoking gun, no bell, ship's bell that said the Guerrero. But there's, there's a lot of compelling evidence to, um, uh, that, that points to the, that site being the Guerrero. Uh, can you, next slide. A um, couple of other uh, uh, shipwrecks that we documented um, with NOAA. Uh, one was called the steamship, the Hannah M. Bell, and also the Acorn. This is ones we did in the last, I would say, five or six years, if you will. Uh, interesting one about the Hannah M. Bell. Some of you probably know that wreck is uh, Mike's wreck. And um, back in the day, that's what it was called. And it was called that way because I understand uh, um, one of the uh, dive boat captains, his name was Mike, he found that wreck. And of course, he named it after himself. <laughs> But uh, we we did work later with uh, Noah, uh, Matt Lawrence, and, and Brenda uh, Altmeyer and the team, and we we did a lot of documentation. Matt Lawrence did uh, research there, and we were able to uh, identify uh, that ship as being a Hannah M. Bell. And you can see down at the bottom, that's a composite site map that we um, developed as part of that uh, work. You got a next one, Evan? Um, our organization, too, is part of what we call the African Slave Wrecks Project, and that is a partnership with uh, George Washington University, as well as the Smithsonian, and one of the efforts uh, that came out of that was the uh, work um, that some of our uh, uh, people from our organization, uh, um, Kamal Siddiqui in particular, and this was uh, documentation of the San Jose which was a slave uh, shipwreck that was uh, off the coast of South Africa. And um, very, very cold water. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can see there, there's shackles that were found, um, also ballast. And um, this is also exhibited in the uh, uh, Smithsonian African American Museum of History and Culture, uh, some of the artifacts that were received there too. You go to the next slide. And again, as I mentioned, uh, um, because of that effort in our partnership, uh, we do have a small exhibit uh, for featuring uh, DWP and also the work we did with the San Jose in the African Mu Museum of History and Culture in Washington, DC. Next slide. Uh, other things that we're involved in is the youth diving with a purpose, as I mentioned. Uh, so we have a youth program. Uh, and it's it's really just as it, it's just as intense or even more intense as the adult program. Um, they also have different projects that the youth have to do according with uh, above and beyond the the week long field school. And there's a lot of mentoring that, that takes place too. Um, we did been involved with uh, coal restoration um, foundation down there before, and we started a new program called DWB Cares. It's a collective approach to restoring our ecosystem. It's more for monitoring uh, of uh, uh, the marine environment. Go to the next slide. 
And as I mentioned, uh, um, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we celebrated our 15 years there in the History Diving Museum exhibit, and it was a fantastic exhibit. I hope that uh, some of you got a chance to see it. We were very, very proud. And, and uh, you know, we started back in, you know, 2005 with our first field school. And so we, you know, we've come a long way and accomplished quite a bit. And you can see there in the picture, too, that uh, we had a guest visitor, Samuel L. Jackson, that came down. Um, this was part of the filming of his uh, uh, documentary, Enslaved. Unfortunately, I think this piece ended up on the uh, editing floor, <laughs> but it was still it was a great opportunity uh, to meet him and to, you know, uh, let, let him know about all the good work that was, that's was been going on with uh, Diving with a Purpose. You got a next slide, Emily? Okay, now we're going to talk about one of my favorite projects, um, the Tuskegee Airmen Project. Uh, this is one that's really, really dear to my heart. Uh, so those that you don't know uh, who the Tuskegee Airmen are or, or were uh, in World War II, basically the Tuskegee uh, experience was basically the Army Air Corps' attempt to train uh, African-American uh, aviators to fly, maintain combat aircraft, you know. But it was kind of an, ex and it was an experience because they trained them, but the thought was that African Americans were not capable of becoming fighter pilots, were not capable of flying. And the airmen proved them wrong because they became some of the best pilots of World War II. And the fact that bomber groups actually requested them to escort them because they were so good. Um, they trained in Tuskegee Institute. Uh, in Alabama, and actually the airmen includes pilots, navigators, bombardiers, uh, mechanics, nurses, crew, uh, chiefs, cooks, and all support personnel. And so they were all self-contained. And uh, one thing I really would like to say down here too is really, uh, again, that, that this was considered an experiment, but they overcame lots of segregation and prejudice, again, to become one of the most highly respected fighter groups. They flew over 15,000 sorties and flew the longest combat missions of, of the war. And again, they earned that uh, title, Red Tails. And you can see here, there's a picture of their uh, famous P-51 aircraft with the Red Tails. Everybody knew who they were when they saw those Red Tails. Um, you know the next slide. So one of the things that I really didn't know is that uh, during this during this time um, in World War II, uh, a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen, after they finished um, training in Tuskegee, Alabama, they actually went up to Michigan to do advanced training. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why they did that is because the climate and the terrain mimicked the European theater. And so they, they were able to do up there and go uh, do some advanced uh, training. One of the bases was, was, was Selfridge up there. And so to, two Tuskegee Am uh, plane wrecks were discovered in the Michigan area. One was located in Lake Huron, and that was flown by Lieutenant Frank Moody. And the other was in the St. Clair River, flown by First Off Officer uh, Nathaniel Rayberg. You can go to the next slide. So the primary aircraft used by the Tuskegee Airmen was not the, uh, up there in Michigan, was not the P-51 Mustang. It was the P-39 Era Cobra. It was manufactured by Dell Aircraft. Um, it was a heavily armed um, uh, aircraft and uh, it was very good for them to, for, for training and, uh, and, and target practicing. And that's a picture of the uh, P-39 Era Cobra. You can go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little about, uh, again, uh, we're going to concentrate on Lieutenant Moody's um, uh, uh, craft and, and his accident. This is taken from uh, the Times Herald, and it tells about that this was an account from uh, Miss Cecil Fowler who saw the crash. Um, it was just a repeat here what she said and what she saw. 
She said it was the most horrible thing I had ever witnessed. There were four planes and I was watching them from a front window as I usually do when they're engaged in gunnery practice. Then everything happened so fast, it seems unbelievable. Smoke started coming from the tail of the second plane and I could see it was in trouble. The pilot apparently noticed it and tried to lift his ship. It was a feeble effort, but the plane seemed to lift only for a few feet, then it crashed, nose first into the water. I saw a big splash and the plane went out of sight. Moody's body was not recovered until it washed ashore in Port Huron on June 4th, 1944, two days before D-Day and the invasion of Normandy. You got a next slide. So again, I mentioned that uh, Lake Huron wreck was flown by Lieutenant Frank Moody. And it, it, the wreck was actually discovered by uh, David Lozinski, who was a member of at the time of the uh, Oakland County Sheriff's Department. And he, this discovery was made on April 11th, 2014. And it was exactly 70 years to the day of his accident. It was like, it was time for Lieutenant Moody's uh, story to be told. And it's interesting when they did find it, right, they found like the cockpit door and I believe they thought it was kind of like, uh, it looks like maybe a door from a, a Volkswagen uh, Beetle, if you will. But then subsequently they found more uh, evidence that it was an aircraft. And the sheriff forces contacted uh, Wayne Lusardi, who is the state archeologist for uh, the state of Michigan. And he works uh, for NOAA at the, uh, Thunder Bay up there in now Pena, Michigan. Now, we've done a lot, a lot of work with um, Wayne Lusardi and Noah, and so he contacted us to, to see if we wanted to uh, assist in uh, investigating and documenting uh, Lieutenant Moody's uh, um, plane wreck. And of course, I jumped at it immediately because uh, these are my heroes, and this was a great opportunity. And I, I know the picture's a little small there, but the, we put together a small uh, team uh, members from DWP, the state of Michigan, and NOAA uh, to, to document that site. And going from left to right, that's uh, Wayne Lusardi, who's, who was served as the principal investigator. And he has such a compassion for the Tuskegee Airmen, and he's done so much research, and you know we couldn't participate in this project without him. Um, then it's myself, it's next to Wayne, going from left to right. Stephanie Gandula, she works for NOAA. That's Kamal Siddiqui, um, DWP lead instructor board member. Melody Garrett, who's also uh, a lead instructor uh, for DWP. Um, Jay Hagler, uh, also board member and lead uh, uh, instructor for DWP. And Ernie Franklin, a uh, lead instructor too as well. So we had a small team and uh, we had a week to document uh, that site. You can go to the next slide. So you can see here, this is our vessel. You can see how big it was, a huge state-of-the-art vessel. <laughs> Actually, it was a pretty small, it was tight confines. Um, but it was a really beautiful area up there in Port Huron, Michigan. And our base operations was actually uh, a Coast Guard uh, station um, right there. You can see it was right next to the lighthouse and it's the bottom uh, top view over there. And we were right across, uh, that's the Blue Water Bridge over there. We were right across from, from Canada. And I would walk around and my, my cell phone would think I was, uh, you know, an international. <laughs> I was getting all kind of international roaming charges uh, just uh, being right there in Canada. You can go to the next uh, slide. Really beautiful area. Uh, this is kind of a, just a, a, a map or of the uh, wreck site showing locations of various artifacts from the wrecks. Um, and then you can see up there in the top, the, the, the fuselage gun, uh, over there on the, the right, the wings, um, instrument panel, the tail section, etc. And if you look down at the scale, you can see, uh, you know, the scale there, 420 feet. And obviously you can see that the wreck site was spread over an extremely large area. And this illustrates the violence uh, of the crash. Uh, it's only where the artifacts are spread out all over. 
we go to the next slide, Emily. So I'm, I'm going to show a few pictures here of uh, some of the artifacts and, and, uh, and uh, pieces of the wreckage. This one in particular uh, was really the most moving to me. When we, when we first started uh, uh, documenting the site, we had to remove algae and, and uh, stuff from, from the wreck site. And this is a wing section. And as you can see, as we move the uh, algae uh, across from the wing, that military Army Air Corps star became visible. And again, this was really moving to me. It really almost brought tears to my eyes when I saw this because the, the importance to me was that, you know, these, these airmen, these Tuskegee airmen gave their lives, you know, for their country. And especially at a time when their country really didn't believe in them, although they believed in their country. And so this was a very, very moving, and it's actually one of my favorite pictures and, that I've uh, ever taken. You can go to the next slide. Uh, other parts of the aircraft, you can see the in engine section here. Um, you can see I was covered with uh, algae and moss, if you will, uh, the drive shaft. And you can see the bottom, how that would look um, together as a, a piece. Can go to the next slide. Um, we saw the uh, tail section and propeller, and you can see there's a picture down the bottom. Um, just to give you a little uh, scale there. That's uh, Kamal Siddiqui documenting the the tail section, and you can see the propeller. You only can see one part of the prop. The other part was missing there. You got the next slide. And as I mentioned too, that one of the things that we saw too there was they and documented is the cockpit door. And we were only were able to see one uh, uh, cockpit door. We never found the other one. We, the landing gear here, you can see. And even the one in the top uh, left-hand corner, it almost looks like it still has air in it. Um, it was actually in pretty good condition. You can go to the next slide. We found several 50 caliber machine guns uh, on, on the sea bottom floor. You can see that's a picture of me, just to give you some scale. Of the uh, of the fifty caliber machine guns. You can go to the next slide. And as I mentioned, uh, they were actually doing gunnery practice and target practice. So actually, the sea floor was littered with fifty caliber rounds. They were literally all over all over the place. So there was live am ammunition down there that we had to be careful. And if you uh, not sure about how big a 50 caliber round is. This, here's one. Uh, this was actually a, a keychain. <laughs> I don't know who has 50 caliber key keychains, but I I purchased this just to uh, let people know and give give you a perspective of how you know large these rounds were. And you can see there too is a gun pod. Uh, so very interesting. You can go to the next slide. One of the biggest uh, uh, pieces of wreckage that was, uh, or one of the most important features here, um, was the instrument panel and with the radio call number. Um, when, when we talk about the smoking gun, if you will, um, the, or the ship's bell with the name on it, this is it. Uh, the radio call number is a unique identifier for each aircraft. And so once this was identified, they knew exactly who the pilot was and the aircraft. So this was extremely, extremely important. You got the next one, Emily. So we, we still do drawings and, and documentation of the wreck, as well as taking pictures, as you saw there. Um, that beautiful one down there in the wing section that was done by, uh, again, Wayne Lusardi. He's not only archaeologist, he looks to also be an artist. <laughs> he did a very great job. You can go to the next slide. And again, uh, just showing how the um, drawing uh, relates to the actual pictures uh, of the um, wreckage there. You can see a tail light up there. Um, we have an armored uh, windshield, uh, also the drive shaft. And again, you can see the Army Air Corps star in the landing here. 
go to the next slide. Okay, well, I'm going to go back. Emily, this is why I'm going to try to see if we can do this now. <laughs> okay. Let me. Um, I have a short video. Hopefully, I can, I can try it. All right, I'm going to stop my works. share and let you do that. So let's give it a whirl. Hopefully, it works. <laughs> So um, after we finished documenting the uh, site there, um, we, we wanted to pay respects to uh, Lieutenant Moody. Um, we laid a reef down uh, at the site, and you can see there Wayne Lusardi and also um, Ernie Franklin there too. Um, we also visited the National Museum of uh, Tuskegee Airmen there in um, Detroit. And part of the dialogue there was uh, talking about raising artifacts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, for eventual exhibit in the uh, museum. And so we had some good dialogue there too. Very interesting story while we were there. Ernie Franklin, who's uh, I mentioned him, he's at the uh, in the bottom left. He's all the way to the to the right in that picture of the, the museum there. Our Ernie Franklin was uh, born and raised in Detroit. Uh, he's also a graduate of Tuskegee University. Um, well, while we were in there, we were looking at some of the archives there, and he saw a picture of his math, his high school uh, um, math teacher. Uh, his name was uh, Richard Macon. And he noticed that uh, his math teacher was a Tuskegee Airman. And he never knew that, uh, and it was really amazing. But not, that, or not only that, he was in the same flight class as Lieutenant Moody. I mean, you can't really write this stuff. So, I mean, you can't make this up. So we went there to the museum and, uh, and amazingly, uh, you know, he found this out. So it really almost put chills down our spines, if you will. You can go to the next slide. So in 2018, um, Wayne Lusardi and also uh, uh, teamed up with uh, Dr. Brian Smith, who's the uh, president of the Tuskegee Airmen Museum up there in Detroit. And they uh, um, recovered some of the artifacts there and presently undergoing rest, uh, a restoration and conservation. And you can see there the uh, cockpit door um, that, that's in the um, bottom right. And also to, to the far left is actually the instrument panel is kind of hard to see, and as well as the blast shield, the, the cockpit. And so these artifacts will eventually be displayed in the new National Tuskegee Airmen Museum uh, in Detroit. You can go to the next slide. There were actually 14 airmen uh, that perished in the uh, Michigan area. And um, so we really wanted to do more than just uh, lay that reef down. We really wanted to recognize uh, not only these airmen who perished in the area, but all Tuskegee airmen. So you can go, go to the next slide. 
So we are actually resur um, um, dedicating a memorial um, to the Tuskegee Airmen, Airmen in the Port Huron uh, area. It's going to be actually in a flag plaza along the St. Clair River. Uh, we've actually started the fabrication and of the, of the uh, monument, and it's going to be placed there. And we're going to have a dedication to the memorial um, the end of August, August 28th. Can you go to the next slide? And here it's an obelisk fabrication. So you can see there's a picture of the memorial as a, just, just the uh, blank uh, memorial. And there's a bronze relief up, um, that you see there. It's an artwork. And that's going to be placed on the obelisk as part of the uh, monument. And, the, and so it's going to be really beautiful. We're very excited uh, about it. You can go to the next slide. So some of the things that we're thinking about uh, forward work, if you will, um, talking to Wayne Lusardi and, and, and also Brian Smith, there's a few things that we would like to do. Um, one of the things is, again, recover remaining artifacts of the uh, Lieutenant Moody's P-39 for restoration and, and again, display in the National Tuskegee Airmen Museum in Detroit. And uh, again, they actually have a new facility there. And so, um, uh, Wayne and also uh, Dr. Brian Smith were maybe looking at this August, early August, to start recovering some more of the artifacts, maybe the entire wing section and some of the other artifacts that may, that could actually be, uh, again, uh, part of an exhibit in the, in the museum. Other things that we would like to do is document uh, uh, Flight Officer Nathaniel Rayberg's P-39 that, that was discovered in St. Clair River. Um, again, Unfortunately, some of that, that aircraft has been looted, um, but has not been officially documented. So that's one of the things that Wayne uh, Lusari wanted to uh, think about doing is uh, trying to document that site. And again, as I mentioned, there were other uh, Tuskegee Airmen accidents that happened in the area. Not all of them are in water. Um, so there are a few other aircraft that, that, that we knew um, they did crash within uh, in the lake or, or, or in the uh, river area. And so one um, part of the idea is to search too for uh, those uh, a wreckage of those um, of those airmen. And that would include William, William Sadat Singh, uh, Lieutenant William Hill, and Lieutenant Nathaniel Hill's aircraft. You go to the next slide. Uh, just a little uh, upcoming things that we're doing as far as uh, DWP. I mentioned we have a CARES program, Collective Approach to Restoring Our Ecosystem. Um, we'll be doing that in June and July. Um, again, hopefully with COVID, you know, so a lot of these things are subject to change, but um, our youth program, Field School, will be in Biscayne National Park in July. I mentioned the memorial ceremony uh, dedication, that will be in August. Um, our adult field school, we're moving that September. And we're actually doing our third international field school, and that's in Costa Rica to actually document uh, potential slave shipwrecks there in uh, Costa Rica. We've done field schools in Mozambique <coughs> and, and previously uh, Costa Rica too as well. And if you want to find more information about diving with a purpose and, and the work that we're doing, just go to our website and divingwiththepurpose.org. And um, our field schools are open to all divers. Um, uh, you don't have to have archaeology experience. We actually teach you that. We just want to make sure you're good divers to participate in the program. You can go to the next one. I think that may be it. So I want to thank you. And, uh, and thank you for um, bearing with us with the technical difficulties. It's a little disappointing like the video. Uh, the light, uh, it basically shows uh, part of the wing and the aircraft. Uh, but I uh, just want to thank you again for, for having me and uh, telling my story. I'll be glad to uh, field any questions if I can. Awesome. Yes. Thank you very much. And that's where I feel bad because I have, because I've been on, on uh, duty for, for screen change, I haven't been able to see everybody's questions and stuff. So I'm going to take a second to scroll up and find every my first one. Oh, I've got see I've got people from the Great Lakes area they they really appreciate learning about this oh excellent um let me find 
Do, 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 do. Okay, from um, Lynette, L Lana. Oh, I'm butchering names. So <laughs> what was the significance of the red tail on the P-51s? Oh, uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. Well, they, they, they wanted to be known that it was them and, and have them be identified. Uh, so that was their way of letting, uh, you know, um, people know that that, that was uh, the airmen and that's who they were. Excellent. Um, also, and this kind of ties into that, and I think this is a big one. How was the crash site discovered? Was it just by accident? I know you mentioned the gentleman that did find it, but was he actively searching for that or kind of just came upon it? Right, yeah, that, and that's what I mentioned too. This was kind of by happenstance. I'm not sure why he, in particular he was diving in that area. Maybe uh, he, he, did, he did get wind of some uh, uh, artifacts that were down there. But again, I, I believe that uh, he actually thought it was a um, car wreck or part of a car. Mm -hmm. um, while, they were, while they were diving down there. And then subsequently they found more um, pieces and uh, they found that, and then they realized that it was an aircraft. And that's mm -hmm. when he contacted uh, um, Wayne Lusardi in um, Thunder Bay. Oh, excellent. And Wayne again is the state archaeologist. That's great that he did that, that he had the knowledge to actually, you know, go ahead and actually contact an archaeologist. That's good on him yes. for that. <laughs> yeah, um, Michael would like to know what was the average depth of the various wreckage finds on the Moody expedition? No, oh, that, that's a great, great question. Um, actually, it was pretty shallow. Um, I, I think uh, I wouldn't say no more than 30 feet, um, most of it between 20 and 30 feet. Uh, also, people like to ask, well, how cold it was. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was another, yes, there that's is. another, another <laughs> question. Yeah. And actually, it wasn't too bad um, during that time of year. We we always dive there in August. That's my, my thing. I'm not going up there any other time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the actually water temperature varied like very uh, high 60 to even 70 degrees around there. So it was in the high 60, not too bad. I had a five mil on with a vest and everything too. So it wasn't too bad. <laughs> But I know for Florida, we're Florida wimps and, you know, <laughs> we right. like our 80 degree water. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. I know that one you asked. Um, oh, this is excellent from Barbara. What are some of the differences in working on a shipwreck versus an airplane wreck? Well, as, as far as the archaeology principles, they, they all, it's, it's, it's the same. Uh, we approach it the same way uh, as far as, you know, our mapping techniques and, and that type of thing. The difference is, is obviously you're dealing with an aircraft so you, uh, as opposed to a ship. So it's uh, you would want to become more familiar with uh, uh, an aircraft, uh, uh, you know, the different types of aircrafts, um, instrumentation and that type of thing. So you want to do your homework too a little bit more and concentrate on the aircraft as opposed to, you know, a, a shipwreck. So obviously there's different uh, uh, pieces of the aircraft. And so you want to become familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, were you able, were, with the research you guys were able to do, were you able to determine the cause of the crash in Lake Huron? Oh, um, that's, that's a good question, but unfortunately, uh, um, no research was done as far as I, I, I as far as my uh, knowledge, as uh, actually investigating the uh, the, the accident. Mm -hmm. um, from what I understand, it may have just been engine failure. But at the time, too, you know, um, the military didn't want to, ex you know, extend or uh, resources uh, to do the investigation. They were at war at the time too. So unfortunately they really didn't, you know, put in the uh, resources and the manpower to try to investigate the, the accident at the time. Mm -hmm. um, from Caitlin, she's got a couple of them. What are some of the ways to fund the costs associated with this type of diving and project? Um, especially because, you know, you're working with the state and actually the federal government with NOAA on that. So did you guys, you know, work with grants or was, you know, how did you fund this, this expedition? Actually, uh, for, for the first part of that expedition, um, 
the boat and some of the like uh, uh, tanks and and that type of thing was uh, paid for by NOAA, uh, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. But we all paid our own way to go up there and 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 dive uh, on and volunteer. So um, I think Wayne subsequently did get some more grants to do some more research uh, on the project. But that particular one, it was more of a volunteer effort. But uh, NOAA did pay for the for the, they supplied. Uh, the vessel that we used was a small NOAA vessel right. and so and, and tanks and some of the supplies uh, associated with that but the other part of it came out of our own pocket but it was something <laughs> that we wanted to do it was kind of dear to our heart right um, and has DWP used photogrammetry as a method in their site documentations that that's a, that's something I want to do we have not we were just starting to learn about that actually a couple of our members have taken photogrammetry classes, and that's something that we're trying to look at and implement. And it's not too cheap uh, to do some of that work, but I know uh, Wayne and, and Noah and, and some of those folks are getting more and more into that. And also 3D modeling, um, which trying to see a lot more of that, too. So that, that's, that's, that's coming along, too, as well. Um, yes, and I, I this is kind of with the video. Um, to Chris Dutton, one of our, our members and board members. Hopefully what I'm hoping we can do is maybe you can send me the, the video you, we wanted to try and play. And what I'll do is I can tie that into the presentation so people can still get to see it. Yeah. I've, I've got some yeah. fun. So yeah. we'll not really apologize. That I'm sorry. I'm sorry <laughs> that didn't work out. I know that's the that's the downfall of technology sometimes. <laughs> but so we will try and get that to, to everybody. Um, Okay, let's see. Oh, from Kurt. So which came first for you, diving or archaeology, and how did you get started in each? Oh, that's great. That's a great question. Um, definitely the diving came first. Uh, I was diving, uh, like I said, I started in 1992. And um, so I had been diving for quite a while uh, when it, uh, before I got involved with diving with a purpose. But um, actually, I grew up in New York, and diving was something I didn't even think about <laughs> growing up there in New York. But I always loved swimming, always loved uh, the water. And so when I moved to Florida, I moved to Florida because I, I started working for NASA. And um, I always loved the water. And then a friend of mine and I, we, we started, I started snorkeling, and I was like, hey, I want to take this to another level. And another friend of mine who actually got certified in New York, he said, oh, I'm, a, you know, I'm diving too. You should learn how to get dive. And I did. And then I also found out about NABS, and that's the Association of Black Scuba Divers, after I, 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 um, I, just right after I got certified. And I started participating in that right away and was a, became a co-founder of Diverse Orlando. But uh, after diving for quite some time, you know, you get a little tired sometimes of taking pictures of fish and seeing a lot of the things too. So I definitely wanted to do a little bit more. I did get into photography. I love wreck diving and that type of thing. But as I mentioned, we were involved in that Guerrero Project documentary. And um, the archaeology, I was always been a history buff and, you know, that type of thing. So it kind of uh, came into play together. And when we got involved with that documentary, and then, uh, as I mentioned, Ken Stewart and Brenda kind of formed this uh, Diving With a Purpose, and they asked, you know, if you're looking for something different, die with a purpose. And, you know, uh, and that's when it all started. And actually, I was the first one to sign up for the program. Uh, <laughs> and that first year, there was only three of us that participated in it. And now each year we're, we're sold out. So, mm -hmm. uh, again, I've been involved in it since the beginning. And it's changed my life being able to travel and do these, some of these amazing things. No, oh, that's that's awesome. And actually, so I know you touched a little bit on, you know, what's coming up with DWP, um, you know, this summer and fall, hopefully. Is there anything, any projects you're going to be specifically, specifically focusing on or ideally focusing on saying everything works out? Well, again, we, we do have, um, uh, for DWP, we, we have specific recs that we're going to be documenting um in, in the florida key national marine sanctuary we partner again with uh, noaa and they 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 have some uh, wrecks that we're, we're going to be uh, documenting there fingers crossed as i mentioned to uh, costa rica uh, there's uh, potential slave ship shipwrecks that we're going to be documenting there um 
And uh, again, um, hopefully if things come out too, we'll be working to, uh, again, do some more work on the Tuskegee project and, and mm -hmm. help uh, raise some of those artifacts too, so. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where um, I have another, one of the gentlemen that actually lives on Lake Huron in, in the summertime and they know that NOAA uses the sonar submersibles to work on shipwrecks. Is that a possible, you know, I guess, collaboration further to look for more either aircrafts or, you know, possibly more shipwrecks, I would think too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Wayne has done several surveys of the lake to, to look for uh, more potential aircraft and he's using uh, sonar as well as uh, multi-beam uh, uh, technology, uh, side scan sonar, multi-beam sonar as well. So um, yes, and, and I think we're planning to do a little bit more uh, surveys there. He has multiple hits, if you will, that, mm -hmm. that he still wants to investigate. Right, perfect. Oh, I just unmuted Lisa, if you would like to pop in. <laughs> well, I know that uh everybody's asking good questions and I'm sure that we have a few more, but I, uh, before we got uh, too much farther, I wanted to thank you, Eric. And uh, Eric, as I said, has been a member of the museum for being our speaker tonight. As a thank you, we're um, giving him a, a one year membership so he can come down when you're in town in June to see the uh, pop culture exhibit that'll be up by then. But uh, we appreciate what you're doing and actually I, I checked in the museum store and we have the uh oh you can't see it there you go we have the yeah. dvd for the guerrero project so if anybody wants to come by and pick that up we have it available mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the enslaved um series was wonderful and i think even though a lot of it that happened at the museum didn't get aired it really gave samuel jackson the the background and the knowledge and kind of that starting point uh, that he was looking for because he he started it with the first episode. Yes. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, and and you can go on with other questions. <laughs> I've got a couple more. Um, so, did any of the airmen that? So the question is, did any of the airmen fight in the war, and where were they stationed? Oh, that, that's a good question. Are you saying uh, Tuskegee Airmen in general? Um, that's because, I'm yeah, guessing so this, that's what it is. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's this this quite a quite a few, and most of them flew uh, out of Europe and Italy. Um, I, forget, I can't remember the name of the base too. But as I mentioned too, they became very very successful in bomber escorts and 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 that type of thing. So yes, yeah, so there's hundreds of them that actually got a chance to fly over there in Europe. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, let me see. We'll do two more. <laughs> um, and this was another one from Caitlin. Have you been able to communicate with treasure sellers about preventing the trade um, from continuing? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, have, have, so have, I guess I think what she's asking is, um, have you been able to either talk to, you know, kind of the treasure salvagers or how you showed that, you know, you were able to purchase, you know, art of what we consider artifacts, you know, just at a, an antique store or something, but to prevent, you know, people from getting in the trade of artifacts or things found on either shipwrecks or it, the plane wrecks, because you said the one has been looted over the years. Yeah, yeah. And that's disappointing, especially when it comes to looting. I mean, there are legal ways to recover artifacts. And, and uh, I mean, just like I mentioned too, uh, we're working with the uh, museum to, to do as such. Uh, um, we have our own guiding principles, if you will, how we deal with uh, handling of artifacts. And so, um, uh, you know, there's always a little controversy in going back and forth with uh, treasure hunters and, and, and archeologists. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say that I've talked to, you know, uh, a treasure hunter in particular that says, you know, don't do this and don't do that. But we just try to bring the importance, you know, forward of uh, our preservation of these artifacts and handling of them with uh, handling in such that, you know, they are telling a compelling story 
And, you know, it, it's not just a trinket or anything that needs to be, you know, sold, brought and sold and or displayed in somebody's house. These things can tell a compelling story about life, uh, culture and our history. So just something we, you know, try to get that message out there. Right. No, I get that. And I think for our last one, and this is a good one because especially, you know, freshwater lake versus the saltwater we're used to down here in Florida. Is there a difference between, you know, the materials aging in the saltwater versus freshwater? Because I, I know some people might not be familiar with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the fresh water uh, actually preserves those artifacts much better than the uh, saltwater environment here, especially when it came to wooden shipwrecks and vessels. You know, uh, you have the uh, worms and, and just uh, different conditions that affect, you know, uh, the, the shipwrecks in the saltwater. Um, fresh water up there, you don't have uh, a lot of that um, going on. It's cooler, too. Um, the one problem they're having up there now, too, is not, uh, you know, the same things that happen here, but uh, zebra mussels and that type of thing are invasive species have affected some of the um, shipwrecks and uh, other items up there as well. So they have their own problems to deal with, but it definitely preserves it much better. I've done some of the shipwrecks up there in the, in the lakes, and some of them look like, you know, you can bring it up and and sail them again. You know, some <laughs> of them are really that great condition. And you just don't see that, um, you know, in saltwater environment. No, that, that makes sense. Definitely makes sense. So, well, I think that starts wrapping it up. I know I've had a bunch of people saying thank you. And it was a wonderful presentation. Jay and Vanessa said hello, of course. Um, so everyone thought this was absolutely wonderful and appreciate it. And I, I just keep, and now, now they're all pouring in and <laughs> thanking you for no, everything. I want to thank everybody. No, this is, this was great. And like I said, um, you know, hopefully you and I can figure out with the video thing so I can share that with folks. Cause I've had folks ask that as well. Um, but thank you so much for, you know, joining us and providing this wonderful presentation. Um, this was absolutely fantastic. Um, Lisa, you got anything? Um, just to, again, thank Eric, thank uh, Barbara and uh, Bob for being members and being sponsors and just put it out there. If anybody is interested in becoming a member or a sponsor to uh, contact me at director at divingmuseum.org. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support and uh, we look forward to the next Immerse Yourself. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you for, again. Thank you for having me. Oh, it was our pleasure. Well, so long and thanks for all the fish, everyone. We'll see you guys next month. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Okay, thank you.